Okay, so we've introduced the idea of elastic collisions, but we want to talk about how realistic that is for real-world, everyday collisions. So let's start with a typical sports collision um, that we might see between a stationary ball and a higher mass um, piece of equipment. So I'm thinking a tennis racket and a ball when it's being served, or a golf club and a ball when it's on a tee. In either case, the velocity of the ball is zero at the start, and in those typical examples, you have follow through um, as you are swinging that racket or club. And so your velocity at the beginning of that collision is about the same as your um, velocity at the end of that collision. So if we used that new tool that's specific to elastic collisions to think about the maximum possible speed that ball at rest could have, we can think about the big mass Let's choose a golf club for this. The big mass as object one, and the little mass, the golf ball, as object two. So if we think about that tool that we have on the right side of our slide, we would have the club velocity minus zero for the start, and then the end would be the ball's velocity minus the original club velocity if we're choosing to have that follow through which means that if we add that velocity of the club, whether it's 10 meters per second or 20 meters per second, if we add that same velocity to both sides, then what we've found out is the statement here at the bottom of the slide, that the maximum final velocity that the ball can have in these stationary start examples is twice the initial velocity that we put into it in our serve or our, um, our golf swing. And it's going to be smaller because we might slow down after the collision. It's going to be smaller because these aren't actual elastic collisions. And we'll think about that with another sports example um, next. But that's the maximum provided to us by the laws of physics. Okay, so let's think about Super Bowl baseball then. In this example, the baseball um, is not going to be at rest to begin but with, but we can use that same idea of follow through with another example. So we're going to use an example where um, no one's trying all that hard in this baseball game because they know that they're playing with a super ball. So the pitcher throws 20 meters per second. It's pretty slow for baseball speeds. And the batter takes a half-hearted swing at 15 meters per second and keeps going when after they hit the baseball. So if we use those numbers and our tool that we had just introduced, what we end up with, so the ball's velocity is 20 to the left, negative 20, the bat's velocity is 15 to the right, positive 15. That means that they're coming together at 35 meters per second. And because the bat continues at 15 meters per second, the ball is launching sideways at over 110 miles an hour. 50 meters per second. That is not how real baseball works. People have to work pretty hard to get a um, homer out of the park, um, but this would have been pretty easy for, for those people to do. So instead, we introduce an idea called the coefficient of restitution. This idea that, okay, we have tools to be able to handle an elastic collision when we want to know both final velocities, but we also want to be able to handle real world circumstances. This is a way to do that with our toolkit here in Physics 125. So we've talked about how in a um, fully elastic collision, we don't lose any kinetic energy. And so that's a kind of maximum um, that we could have on this coefficient of restitution. If we lose none of that kinetic energy, we're going to define that as being C equals 1, the maximum value for a coefficient that can go between 0 and 1. And C equals 0, the other extreme, is if they stick together. So imagine this, base, or this ball bouncing on the wall idea. If I throw it at the wall and it bounces back with the same speed, it's completely elastic. If I throw it at the wall and it sticks there, like a ball of mud, then it's lost all of its kinetic energy and it's completely the opposite. 
That's that range of coefficients that we're going to be seeing with this new idea. You can also kind of think of it as rubberiness. So if C equals 1, then the objects are completely rubbery, like a perfect super ball. And if C equals 0, they don't bounce at all. Mud isn't going to bounce. So if we wanted to measure C quite quickly, we could throw an object against a solid wall or the floor and measure the outgoing speed compared to the incoming speed. If they're the same, C equals 1, and if there was no bounce, that outgoing speed is 0. So just look at this quick picture in the bottom left here. What would the value of C be in this example? Okay, so incoming speed means before the collision, that's the 20 meters per second downwards, but because we use the word speed, we really do just mean the value of 20. And the outgoing speed is after the collision, after it's hit the floor, it's now only moving at 10 meters per second, and so we have 10 divided by 20, and we end up with 0 0.5. This object is neither extremely bouncy, nor um, can it just not bounce at all. And that 0.5 is actually pretty close to um, an, a real baseball. Baseballs aren't known for being particularly bouncy. If we followed an actual observed pitch and hit in baseball, maybe the pitcher throws at 100 kilometers per hour from this picture and the batter is swinging at 100 kilometers too. That means that the ball and the bat are coming towards each other at 200 kilometers per hour. That's the incoming speed. And if the batter has follow through, and we actually watch that baseball leave home plate at 210 kilometers per hour, then that difference, which would be the outgoing speed, is 110, since they're both moving in the same direction. We take one minus the other. So then when we plug those numbers into, a, um, into our coefficient of restitution example, we have 110 divided by 200, or 0.55. And when we actually measure these things with real objects, the coefficient of restitution as we've described it is kind of a simplification. It does depend on how fast things are going. But we can use it at least as a starting point to be able to handle real world circumstances. So if we have, in all of our physics um, examples, if we have two objects that are heading towards each other, in order to know what the result is, we have to know a little bit more about what we know is supposed to happen. Are we told that they're going to stick together? That's a lot of our examples, um, we're given that information. Are we told that it's, it's an elastic collision? Are we told that we're going to have all of the kinetic energy that we started with? In those cases, that's fully solvable with the tools that we had. But for all of the in-between situations, we can use a reasonable coefficient of restitution to say, well, these objects are more likely to be pretty bouncy, so C equals 0.7, or they aren't really intended to bounce much at all, C equals 0.3, and then we can handle them the way that we do in an elastic collision. The only change to our equation is just a C out front on the left, because that V1 initial minus V2 initial is a measurement of the incoming speed, and the V2 final minus V1 final is a measurement of the outgoing speed. And so this is a way to handle anything in between so that even our simplified physics 125 understanding of these um, real world situations that aren't perfectly sticking together or perfectly elastic, we are still able to handle them and get a reasonable answer from it. And that's really our goal with a lot of the, the ways that we handle um, physics in this class is we are building a tool to be able to deal with real world circumstances without going into calculus or beyond because there's plenty more complicated math but we are learning all of the standard physics that you'd learn at any of the levels um, that we offer here at GRCC or elsewhere. So in the next video we'll be talking about two-dimensional collisions 
And we'll be wrapping up the chapter by thinking about rockets too. So something to look forward to. I will see you in that next video.